О, привет! Здравствуйте! Привет всем! Бог Сима! Хясас! Hi, guys! Um, as you guys know, today it's Sunday. Uh, not really, but kind of. So it's going to be the next stream, covering the next three letters of the Istomin Bukwar. I decided to do three because we still have nine letters left, meaning that we will cover three every week or every week or, or so, uh, meaning that this week we'll be covering bukva U, or actually right now, we're covering bukva U, bukva Yer, Yat, our favorite letter, and then next week we're going to be covering this one, Yu, Ya, Ksa, and lastly Psa, the Greek letters Th and Ijitsa. Those are going to be the last ones. And there we go. So we're basically going to be continuing where we left off last time with Bukva U. But before we do that, I just want to say thank you to Van Dog for helping me out with some of the uh, old Slavic translations. He helped me out immensely. Thank you so much. Uh, there was some Greek stuff uh, and I um, got some help from Leonidas and Julius, so thank you very much for helping me out. And a special shout out to the people who decided to support me on Patreon. Uh, thank you very much for supporting the channel and helping the channel out. It makes making stuff like this and streams um, a lot easier because it allows me to invest time into making um, videos like this and streams like this. So thank you so much. Um, so the first letter we're going to cover is Bukwa Yer. Um, oh, I mean, Bukwa I. Um, and the history of this letter is kind of interesting because it goes back to Ultra Slavonic, at least this, this uh, form, right? And in Ultra Slavonic, this letter was called Yeri. Um, the exact um, quality of this vowel is kind of unknown. Um, most people say it sounded something like I. You have people who are linguists who basically claim it was more of a back vowel, something like U. Um, but eventually this U sound started developing and in pre-revolutionary Russian, the name Yeri changed to Yeri. Basically the same thing, it was just spelled differently. So the Ultra Slavonic version actually used a letter that this manuscript even doesn't contain because it became obsolete quite early on in the old East Slavic development. And eventually the name changed when the Bolsheviks came around. They decided to rename a lot of these letters. It wasn't exactly their doing because um, it actually happened before, but it changed to the modern U. So um, this is a very difficult sound for non-natives to pronounce. I know I had a lot of trouble with it. I sometimes still make mistakes. Because in a lot of Slavic languages, uh, especially South Slavic, like Croatian, this sound actually reflects into an E sound. So whenever Proto-Slavic or Russian uses E, uh, South Slavic languages, well, I can speak from experience uh, about Croatian, will use E. Um, so we can see the different forms, right? We have this drawing of this guy, um, and then we have these forms and shorthand forms. Obviously, shorthand is very difficult to read, especially Old East Slavic or Early Modern. Um, but when we examine this, we can see that this letter is actually not a single letter. It's a ligature. So it's made up of two different symbols to create one symbol. And um, Ultra Slavonic and oh, Ultra Slavonic and Old East Slavic actually are incredibly inconsistent when it comes to this ligature because they use four different letters to create it. So the main part we can see right here is actually a letter we're going to cover later on. It's bukva yer, this letter. So it consists of this letter plus a letter we have covered before. And that is this letter, it's the letter I. And in, in the uh, old um, Church Slavonic name of this letter would be E. Um, but in old texts, especially in Ultra Slavonic, we can encounter a lot of different forms. So instead of yer, we can actually encounter the letter yer, which is the one we covered last week. 
and the one with buqua yer is actually more prevalent than this form. This is usually regarded as a more modern form. This is also the modern form Russian uses. Um, so the, the olden texts, texts from the, let's say, 10th century, 9th century, all the way up to like the 16th century, will actually use a different form. So that will use yer. And then this letter, uh, e, sometimes they use the other e, which is called ije in uh, Ultra Slavonic. And we cover that before as well in a different stream. And the numerical value of this letter was non-existent because it didn't have one. And the development, so as I said, in Ultra Slavonic, it probably represented the sound U or more a back vowel like U. Um, but this comes from Proto uh, or Balto Slavic in which it had a long back closed vowel. So it was something like U. And this U eventually shifted to Proto Slavic U. So that would be the development of this letter. Uh, moving on to the pictures. So uh, moving on to the pictures, actually several pictures that we covered before as well, because Isomin basically decided to repeat some pictures. We're going to notice that later as well. So the first one is Viese. And notice the stress. So the stress is actually on the first syllable. And in modern Russian, this is not the case. So in modern Russian, we would expect something like viesi, but in this text, we can encounter viesi, which is scales in English. Actually, in English, there's two different forms. You have scales, which is the plural form, and the singular form, scale. Both are used. Um, but viesi is actually the plural form of vies. Um, and why would you use a plural form? That's basically because, like in English, a scale is basically made up of two plates or balls, um, which is why they probably decided to use the plural form. So as I said, uh, in modern uh, Russian, we expect something like viesi, which means scales, uh, and vies itself is something like weight or authority, so it has different meanings. Um, this comes from Old East Slavic, uh, which we had something like viesa, uh, which meant heaviness, weight, or duty, tax, or tariff. So a lot of different meanings. Uh, same with skills, obviously. Second one is uh, a word we also covered in the letter ch, cherv. Uh, this is chasi. Uh, in this case, well, the drawing is incredibly pretty, but we can see that this is a clock, right? And a different meaning of this word would be something like a watch or an hourglass. Uh, in modern Russian, this is chase, it didn't change. And this came from Old East Slavic chasa, meaning time, hour, clock. And this came from Proto Slavic chasa, meaning hour. A lot of different Slavic languages actually still use this chas, meaning hour. Uh, some languages, like Ukrainian or Croatian, uh, they switch to using a different word. Uh, so the Croatian word became sat, which actually comes from Arabic sat, right? Uh, meaning hour. And then this one, um, Vudra. So this is actually an animal. <laughs> so Vudra uh, is an otter. Um, but it actually has a different meaning in criminal Russian slang. And in criminal Russian slang, it me means a rope or a lockpick. So the meaning shifted or it didn't shift. They just decided to use it for, for something else. But Vudra usually means, uh, means otter. Uh, which comes from, uh, all, in modern Russian, this would be Vudra as well, in all East Slavic Vudra, and in Proto-Slavic Vudra. So it didn't really change. Pixel U is one of those annoying Ultra Slavonic letters that has said. Yeah, Ultra Slavonic, yeah, the Unicode for, for that letter is kind of uh, complicated because whenever I write it, certain websites don't want to even, you know, acknowledge its existence. They basically use this little box. It's not their fault, obviously, but it's, it's kind of a, a difficult symbol for them. Most of them don't add it, sadly. Um, because why would you add like all these Slavic symbols? Uh, the next picture, we see vlasi, uh, vlasi meaning hair, uh, which is actually the church Slavonic form of volosa. And volosa is the modern Russian form. So um, as I said, Basically, as I say in every stream, uh, Russian during this period, and even modern Russian to a certain degree, sometimes prefers 
the southern Slavic forms because they were seen as more pure. In modern Russian specifically, these forms usually mean something else. So uh, a good example of this uh, would be Gorod, uh, which in Russian means city. Uh, you also have Grat, uh, which is used for specific cities like Jerusalem, uh, which is the old uh, or the South Slavic form and therefore carries more prestige, right? It's seen as more prestigious. So during this period, they still use Vlasy, meaning hair. Uh, in modern Russian, this was, or this would be Volosy. Um, some people, at least I read that some people do use it, but it's extremely archaic. Uh, this comes from Oli Slavic Lasa, meaning hair for tail or comet, which is interesting, right? Because a tail, uh, so they kind of associated it with a comet, a tail of a comet, uh, which comes from Ultra Slavonic. So this was borrowed from Ultra Slavonic, uh, which came from Proto Slavic Volsa, meaning hair. And then the next one. This will be Krilo, which is wing in English. Um, this didn't really change. So the modern Russian equivalent of this would be Krilo, meaning wing, uh, from Old East Slavic Krilo or Krilo. So the Old East Slavic forms, um, there's actually two of them, one with an E and the other one with an E. So Krilo and Krilo um, had a lot of different meanings. Uh, one of which was wing, second army flank, and then in Ultra Slavonic, it also meant edge or side, uh, but it was written with an E, so Ije, right? the other I. Okay. Uh, Novgorod, exactly. So you have uh, some Russian cities use the Old East Slavic form, so Gorod, uh, while other cities like Volgograd use the Grad version, so the South Slavic version. So the South Slavic version was borrowed from Ultra Slavonic because it was more prestigious, while the Old East Slavic version basically just naturally developed. Um, the next one. This is a very archaic word that a lot of Russians don't understand. Uh, this is tin. And tin is a fence, but especially a fence made out of twigs. So a specific kind of, of fence that you can usually see in villages. Um, modern Russian word for this would probably be something like zabor uh, or agrada, uh, even though that one is not as prevalent as zabor, uh, but they all mean fence. And the only Slavic version or the equivalent of this would be tin, meaning fence or, or a wall even. Um, so modern Russian, that would be stina, uh, which comes from Proto-Slavic tina. Um, the interesting thing is that this word was actually borrowed from the Germanic languages, like a lot of different Slavic words, like chlieb, uh, meaning bread, which was borrowed from Gothic. This is also one of those words that was borrowed from the Germanic languages, and it was borrowed from Proto-Germanic, uh, tuna, meaning fence. So tuna um, eventually became tina. Um, and Proto-Germanic actually borrowed this from Proto-Celtic, because before the Germanic invasions, or when they came into Europe, uh, a large part of Europe was populated by Celtic tribes. So this comes from Proto-Celtic, dunum, meaning stronghold or rampart. Uh, so the meaning shifted from stronghold to fence, which is extremely interesting. But let's take a look at the text. First text. Um, da. So, yer s iotoyu. Yer which is this one, right? This part of the letter, yer, s, with, iotoyu. So this is, the first three words are immediately incredibly interesting because they kind of, they're kind of strange. So you would expect the writer, Istomin, to say something like yer, which is this form, plus i, because in Old East Slavic and Ultra Slavonic, this letter was called i. But he doesn't do that. He decides to use the Greek version. So he says, Yersi Iotoyu. So Iota, which is the Greek name for this letter, he decides to go with that. Maybe because it's more prestigious, uh, maybe because Yersi 
doesn't sound as nicely or doesn't sound as, I don't know, sophisticated maybe even. Uh, we could see the Omega, right? So um, during this period, using the Omega was extremely inconsistent, but this one is actually correct. So whenever a Greek word uses the Yota, uh, you can expect it in Old East Slavic as well. So Yersi Yotoyu, this is by the way, the old uh, instrumental case. So uh, if this was in modern Russian, you could expect something like Iotoy, right? So Yersi Yotoyu, Slozje Yeri Tvorit. So F meaning in, Slozje syllable, Yeri, which is the name of this letter, Tvorit, so creates. Basically, Ye plus Iota in a syllable will create Yeri. Which makes sense, right? This this uh, letter or symbol is created w when two different letters are combined. Next sentence, trudna bez yeri, meaning it's difficult, trudna, difficult without yeri, mnogih slov gavarit, a lot of words say. So it will be difficult without yeri to pronounce or say a lot of words. This makes sense because U is an incredibly, well, it's an incredibly difficult sound to produce, but it's incredibly common in Russian. So without that sound, you will not be able to be, you know, speak Russian correctly. Just a sec. Okay. Third one. O chelavyeche smatri vyezde miere. So all this is an interjection, a very common omega form, which is only used as an interjection. Chelavyeche, so this would be the old vocative case. So a modern Russian doesn't use the vocative case anymore, and vocative case is basically a grammatical form in which you directly address someone. So if I were to address Ivan in Croatian, I would say Ivane. Uh, modern Russian is developing a new vocative case, a second vocative. Um, but that's a story for a different time. So, o chelavyeche smatri, look, viezdje, everywhere. Um, miere. Miere means measure. But this sentence is, it contains a lot more than, than meets the eye. At least that's what I think. So I started digging, right? And basically, I thought that this was a biblical reference. Because in the Bible, we can actually see a lot of different um, analogies. We can actually see that uh, moderation is mentioned several times. And uh, obviously, this is not a stream about religion, but it's important to realize that during this period, a lot of religion did play a role in daily life or life. So basically, people wrote about things that mattered to them, and religion was one of those. So to fully understand a text like this, sometimes you have to refer to the Bible and understand the bigger picture. So I did some digging, right? And I found several um, sentences, several paragraphs that actually talk about this. And one of those uh, is Corinthians 9.25, and it basically says, And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things, which makes sense, right? Oh, chelavyeche, look everywhere, or see measures everywhere, or everything in moderation. And in uh, ultra Slavonic, or in modern Church Slavonic, Russian Church Slavonic, that would be something like, Sviak že podsvizyajsia od vsiech vozdržitsa. Um, we can actually find uh, a different form in um, Excuse me, I just had to drink something. <laughs> we can actually find a different uh, line in Ecclesiastes 9 or 718, which basically says, It's good that thou shaltest take hold of this, yeah. Also from this withdraw not thine hand, for he that feareth God shall come forth of them. And by come forth, he means both extremes. Uh, Church Slavonic version of this would be Blagoti jest tržati se sivo i od sivo ne oskvjeri ruki tvoje ja, jako bojaščim se Boga pospješat sa vsa. So basically, uh, it talks about uh, not going into the extremes, but sticking in the middle, right? Not um, basically looking for the extremes, being satisfied with what you have and do everything in moderation. 
I think this relates to that. I honestly think that this is where this comes from and the original goal of the text. And the second one, Viera Nasledstva Dast Nebesne Gore. Um this is more difficult, but Viera in Russian, modern Russian, also means faith. In a lot of Slavic languages, uh, it still means faith. Nasledstvo. So this would be something like heritage or faith. Heritage gives sky nebesne um, gori, so the hills of heaven. So faith heritage or, or heritage in faith gives will give you access maybe to the hills of heaven. Воистине ти все люди подпора. So indeed or truly. T to you, so this would be Tibie in modern Russian, to you, indeed or truly to you, all people support. So all people will support you then. Fnachalie yeri frieci nistavayet. So at the beginning of a word, right? At the beginning of a word, you don't put this yeri. And this is extremely common, right? So when you study Russian, a lot of the times, one of the things about the U is that you learn that it's never the first letter of a word. Uh, there's several like exceptions, I think like one or two, but usually uh, a word doesn't start with the sound. And that's basically what this line says. So you never put it at the beginning of a word. Obache в трепстве склада слов бывает. So this obache is actually but. So it's, it's an old East Slavic form which means but. So but in трепстве, so in need or whenever something is needed. Склада слов. So this would be the syllables of a word. Syllables of a word or the, the um, not the look of a word, but basically how a word is constructed. Бывает, so will be. So, but in need or whenever needed of syllables in a word is. So it will be part of a word whenever it's needed, basically. Oh, Grisha, привет. <laughs> nice to have you, man. So this one. В небо хотеете буди всяк воздержан. Another incredibly interesting sentence because it means in heaven or, or sky, basically. Nebo means sky. Um, but in this uh, context, it probably means something like heaven. So in heaven, want. So if you want to go to heaven, budi be vsyak every was dirjan, right? Uh, which means be temperate. Don't focus on getting into heaven. So if you want to get into heaven, focus on your own life, do your own thing, but don't do things solely to get into heaven. Ne budeshi bo miesta si odbirjan. So this would be something you won't be. So this is the future tense, which doesn't exist in modern Russian. Nebudyashibo, which is an interjection. Miesta, place, si, to you, odbyashin, rejected. So if you don't focus on getting into heaven, just focusing on your own life, um, you won't be rejected when you eventually pass away. So again, a lot of theology in this text, um, quite complicated. Um, but very interesting. I think we can move on to the next letter. If there are any questions, just please let me know. If not, I'm going to just drink some water. The next letter. Um, this is a letter which still exists in modern Russian. So in Old East Slavic, this letter was called, or in, in Ultra Slavonic, I should say, this letter was called Yer, which eventually led to the revol pre revolutionary Russian for Yer. Uh, but in modern Russian, uh, this is not called Yer anymore, but Mierkiznak, meaning soft sign. And why soft sign? That's because Russian palatalizes a lot of consonants. So whenever a consonant is followed by a front vowel, like ye or e, it's palatalized. It becomes palatalized. So something like le, ye becomes le. Palatalized form of the letter L. 
Um, or when a consonant is followed by this sign or symbol, it basically becomes palatalized. And we can see this at the end of a lot of words. So a lot of words that end in the ye basically get palatalized. And uh, this letter has no numerical value. And it devo developed from Proto or Balto Slavic, E, which eventually became a lax vowel. So it became the Proto Slavic, probably, because we don't quite know um, the exact quality of this vowel, but uh, linguists think that this sounded something like E, uh, which is a sound that modern Ukrainian actually has. So, and this eventually developed to a Russian E, uh, Croatian A, and Polish E. Um, but it didn't really stick around for a long time. So there's uh, an event which we covered in a, in a previous stream, which is known as a fallen vocalization of year. Basically in the 11th and 12th centuries, um, this letter, depending on its position in a word, started shifting or disappearing. So it became vocalized and eventually in Russian became E. And we can see the different forms, shorthand versions. Usually what you can actually see is that they will include a Polish version of this letter. So if we go up, so if we look at Czerw, uh, Czerw, we can see the Polish form. And if we take a look at the C, we can see uh, C. We can see the Polish form as well. So this doesn't exist in Polish. Uh, just a sec. Yeah, F. See, so this is uh, letter F, Fiert, or Fiert, uh, which basically also shows the, the Polish and the Greek versions. But this is not always the case. It's quite inconsistent. And in this case, there is no Polish version because Polish doesn't have the sound. It didn't keep the sound. It's not impo or important in, in contemporary Polish or Polish during this period. So. Um, the different pictures. There's not a lot of them. Uh, what's interesting is at the start, if you guys remember, um, basically there were a lot of different pictures, like sometimes 10 of them. While, while we get closer to the end of this, this uh, book, wide, this primer, it becomes less and less, sadly. So we only have five words. And the first word would be lebit, which is swan in modern Russian. Uh, or in English and in modern Russian, it's stayed the same. So lebed. In all these Slavic, uh, lebed, which meant swan as well. So the Proto-Slavic version is uh, <laughs> kind of um, unknown. Well, there's several different options. Uh, the most accepted one would be something like olbod. Um, but then the on sound, which is the beautiful letter that I always make memes about, um, basically didn't develop into a Russian E. Uh, it was kind of complicated. So uh, some linguists actually think that the Proto-Slavic, uh, that there were two Proto-Slavic versions, one's for the Eastern Slavs or late common Slavic versions, one for the Eastern Slavs and one for the Southern and Western Slavs. Uh, so it's kind of unknown what the exact etymology of this word would be. Uh, it's not really possible to write in Polish even if you wanted to. Polish is incredibly pretty. I, I love it. It's just very difficult to pronounce. Uh, but reading, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the next letter would be koreng. Um, in Russian, this means root or generation. Um, and this comes from Oli Slavic koreng or korea. So all these Slavic actually had two different forms, koreň and kore, meaning root, foundation, beginning, or even descendant. And this comes from Proto-Slavic koru, so u sound, the one that we covered before, was in the Proto-Slavic word, and it meant root. And then this one, this is probably my favorite word of this whole page. Uh, not that there's a lot of words, because, um, well, you guys will see in a second. <laughs> So this word was probably pronounced something like kupel, and a kupel uh, means a font, but not a font as in like Times New Roman or something like that, not like a writing font, but it's a receptacle in a church for holy water. 
Uh, so in the Roman Catholic Church, when you enter a church on our right side, usually you have this little bowl, right? This receptacle with water. And you use that to make the sign of the cross. Uh, in Orthodox churches, you don't have those, as far as I'm aware. Um, but they use it in baptism. So you have this big receptacle, um, basic, basically like a water reservoir, right? In which a child is not submerged, well, partially, and basically baptized. And this uh, in, in um, this manuscript is called Kupiel, um, which is actually still used in, in, in uh, Church Slavonic. Now, the modern Russian word for this is also kupil, uh, which comes from all these Slavic kupele, uh, which meant water reservoir, baptism or font. And this comes from Old Church Slavonic. And the Old Church Slavonic form was kupele, so with a nasal sound. And it had a lot of different meanings, but the most important ones was a place for swimming. So it wasn't even theological. It was just a place for swimming a bath, water reservoir, or related uh, to anything with swimming. And that is because the most likely etymology is kompati, which is the Proto-Slavic word for swimming. Now, this made me think, because if you guys are familiar with how um, religious terms entered the uh, Slavic languages, is that they were usually borrowed because the concept of Christianity was foreign to Slavic peoples, right? So uh, when the Eastern Slavs got baptized, which is in the late 10th century, a lot of these terms, they didn't enter the language, I would say naturally, they were introduced. Um, even in South Slavic, so in the 9th century, when Ultra Slavonic was created, a lot of the, or quite often, the brother, or brothers uh, Cyril and Methodius didn't have any Slavic equivalents of words that they needed because the Slavic peoples didn't have words for font, right? They didn't need it because it wasn't part of their religion. So these brothers, they decided to create their own words. And um, they basically had two options. One was use the Greek word, which is what happens quite often, and just transcribe it into Slavic. So even though it's not Slavic, we will turn it into a Slavic word. The second word is a calc, and a calc is basically a loan translation. A good example of this would be if I told you the, the English word flea market. So it turns out that the word flea market actually comes from French. Uh, marché aux puces, meaning market of fleas. So basically what the English did is they took the word and they literally translated it. Every single part of that marché aux puces is uh, literally translated. So this would happen in Ultra Slavonic quite often. So my theory is that this is a calque. Uh, let me substantiate my claim. So the Koine Greek word for this font is kolumbithra. Uh, and the modern Greek equivalent would be kolimbithra. Um, and if we were to divide this word up into two parts, into two morphemes, we get kolumbao, which means to dive, to plunge, or to swim, and ethra, which is an unproductive suffix forming nouns. So it basically consists of two parts the swim, or the plunge, plus an unproductive suffix forming nouns. If we examine the Ultra Slavonic word, uh, we get kompati, meaning to bathe or to swim, plus ale, meaning un which is an unproductive suffix forming action nouns. So if you guys start connecting these dots, I think this is a calc. I couldn't find any information about it anywhere. Um, maybe someone, you know, did some research on this before, but it makes sense because both the first part means to swim and it both contains an unproductive suffix forming action nouns. In um, Koine Greek, this would be something like ethra or ethra, and in uh, Ultra Slavonic, this would be ele, which in modern Russian is el. So this is probably a calc, a based, uh, a very based Ultra Slavonic calc. 
Um, then we have this word, which is rukayat. Rukayat means handle or hill, uh, which is a word we actually covered in a previous stream um, when we took a look at the word cher or the letter cher. And the modern Russian equivalent would be something like rukayat, rukayatka, or ruchka, uh, which also means pen in modern Russian. Uh, in all these Slavic, this actually meant handle or a harm, uh, armful or a sheaf, which is a bundle of grain. And this probably comes from Proto-Slavic ronka, uh, with a beautiful nasal on, <laughs> ronka plus yate, which means to take. Rukayat. Last one, lin. Um, this is a very common Slavic word. Uh, the English equivalent would be tench or tench. Um, it's a doctor fish, a specific kind of, of game fish, a freshwater fish, and it's found all throughout Eurasia. Uh, so the modern Russian form is uh, lin, and the Proto-Slavic form would be something like lin. So we got animals, a based calc, and some other things. Which brings us to the text. A yer tonko slovit. So yer is the name of this letter, right? Tonko slovit. So um, a lot of the modern terms that we take for granted didn't exist in the 17th century. One of these terms, at least in Russian, was palatalization. They didn't use the term palatalization. They had their own terms for this. And one of them was tonko slovit, which is the Old East Slavic version of palatalization. So tonko meaning thin, slovit, word, uh, parts of words creation, right? So to thinning words. <laughs> um, modern Russian doesn't use this term anymore. They use palatalization, no? palatalizirujet, uh, or smihčat, which means to soften or to palatalize pixel. Uh, Polish isn't that hard to pronounce. <laughs> no, I'm not going to pronounce that. Ultra Slavonic, the first column. Oof, that's a, that's a beautiful like uh, uh, video topic. So, yer tonka slovit, so yer palatalizes or softens v proiznosie glasa. So, in pronunciation of glass. So, what's glass? Glass is voice. Right? But modern Russian doesn't use this form anymore. This is the South Slavic form. The modern Russian equivalent would be golos. So, i proiznosie golosa. But the South Slavic versions were used because they were seen as more, you know, sophisticated. So, v proiznosie glasa. V rečenjah že znanstva i ukrasa. So, again, this rhymes. Beautiful. V rečenjah že... So in sentences, emphasis marker, znanstva, knowledge, knowledge, right? <laughs> and decoration. So this is uh, not used in modern Russian anymore. Modern Russian uses znanje, uh, just like uh, Serbian, uh, and ukrasa. So ukrasa, again, a form that modern Russian doesn't use. This is a South Slavic form. Uh, modern Russian word would be ukrasenje. Um, ukras is what we use in South Slavic. So the next one, v priedi ne stait v konce posledstvet. So at the front or in the front, so modern Russian would say something like priedi. In the front, it's not located, ne, not stait, standing. So it's not located uh, at the front. At the end, posledstvet. So at the end, it will follow. And this basically explains what I said before. This letter is often the last letter of a word if it the consonant is palatalized. So, ling, we can see here as well, right? Just a sec. There we go. This is a word we encountered before. This old East Slavic word obacha, meaning but. V mieste, so in the place, or in its own place. Svojem, tja, or ta, dejstvojet. So, but in its own place, it will function. So, if it's located next to a consonant, or follows a consonant, it will palatalize this consonant, right? Tonko slovit. Next sentence. Tjem mlada duša, jekda je pišeši. So, tjem, meaning with that. Mlada, so this is the 
uh, South Slavic form, Maladaya, would be the old or the East Slavic form, and Mlada Dusha. So we can see the titlo, which means that this word is shortened. And that is because it has some kind of holy connotations, right? Uh, titlo was usually used with holy words. So if a word was seen as specifically important or, or uh, was related to God, it would be shortened. We can see this in Hebrew. We can see this in uh, Armenian, a lot of different languages. So dusha yekda, which is the old East Slavic form of kakda, meaning when, yer pishashi. So with that young soul, when yer is written. Tonkosti v smisle. So tonkosti, again, tonko, tonko, meaning thin, but in this case it will mean fin, uh, fineness or finesse in meaning. V smisle, in meaning. Finesse in meaning, vsekda, always da vzish cheshe. So that you will always find. Finesse in meaning, you must. Da, which is an old uh, or South Slavic uh, particle, so you will find. You will be everywhere. So this is again uh, a future tense that modern Russian doesn't have. So um, you will everywhere place to you have. So you will have a place everywhere. So with intellect. So this is a, a, a word that a lot of Slavic languages still use um with uh, intellect and at the front or in the front uh, not shameful nestydna sidieti so it's not shameful to sit um, which basically means if you're smart or if you have something to say that's backed up like you can back it up um, don't be you know don't feel ashamed because you can substantiate your claim and you can, if you're smart, right? In the case of, if you know something, if you want to share it with the people. So it's not shameful to sit at the front if you know what you're talking about, basically. So tochu is an old East Slavic firm, which means only, tolka in modern Russian, nosi, carry or use, Trud, which means effort, tvoj fnauce. So this is again the second Slavic palatalization in which the k turn into c. So only carry your use, your efforts in your studies or in your lessons. And all these Slavic nauka could also mean something like lessons. And this last one, this is probably a reference to the Bible. Často voznosi v malitvach ti rutje. So again, in modern Russian, this would be rukje, um, but this means chasta often raise in prayers your or to you hands. So often raise your hands in prayer. And I think this relates to Bible verse Timothy 2.8, which basically says, it, will, uh, it is my will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting which in um, Russian Church Slavonic would be something like Hoshchu ubo da molitve tvoriat mužje na vsjacijem mjeste vozdejušče pripodobnija ruku bez gnjeva i razmišljenja. So again, a reference to the Bible. And again, it talks about the existence of the year. Uh, what it means and the uh, thoughts behind the letter itself. Spanish used to do that, but it was just with every word. <laughs> um, last letter, and perhaps the most difficult letter, <laughs> but I'm going to try to do my best and explain it. Uh, just a sec, let me grab something to drink. So hold on, guys. Uh, this is going to be tough. Буква ять. Буква ять. Моя любимая буква. My favorite letter. This letter um, is quite something. It's it's amazing. It's beautiful. It's I'm in love with it. 
but it's a love-hate relationship because it's uh, <laughs> okay um let's start out at the beginning so basically this letter comes to us from ultra slavonic and in ultra slavonic this letter was called yete uh, which eventually got adopted into old east slavic um in pre-revolutionary russian this became yet and in modern russian it sadly doesn't exist anymore so the bolsheviks um, when they reformed the language in 1917 and 1918, they removed this letter. And that is because in the 20th century, this letter had fully merged with the E sound that modern Russian has, or Ye sound. So for kids back then, learning about this letter, learning what this letter was, where it was located, was basically the end of the world. There's a quote which basically says, I don't know who said it, but I remember reading about it, that this letter was fueled with the tears of countless students because they simply didn't know where to write it. Um, this has been going on for like since the 18th century. This letter started like was basically fully or had fully merged with the air sound. So for like 200 years, 200 plus years, students... Russian students, right? Not foreign students, but Russians didn't know where to put this letter. They basically had to learn like 130 different routes by heart um, uh, to be able to know when to use it, where to use it. And it was kind of seen as an achievement, but it was expected. <laughs> so an expected achievement. Um, there's a phrase which I commonly use in Russian. It's nayat which means adlichna, meaning perfect. Because if you wrote something na yat or on the yat, you basically knew where all of the yatsis were located, uh, which made you a good student. And so modern Russians don't know what this means. If you would tell someone na yat or to a modern Russian person, they wouldn't know what the saying meant, right? So this letter is cursed and it's amazing and I love everything about it. <laughs> So how did this letter come to be? Well, this letter comes to us from Proto-Indo-European um, and eventually came to us to Balto-Slavic. And Balto-Slavic actually had several sounds that would eventually become yat. One of these sounds was oi, second one was ai, third one was ai, and the fourth one wasn't a diphthong, what it was e. Yeah, just like Daniel said, that's perfect. Bieli, biedni, bledni, bies, ubiežal, obiedat, flies. So, because these kids, students, didn't know where to put it, they would devise and think of these poems to just basically learn the poems by heart. Because if they learned the poems by heart, they would know where to put the yats. A lot of ingenious ways of remembering where to put it. But anyway. So in Brodo uh, or in Balto Slavic, you had four different letters that turned or eventually turned into this yat sound. To make matters worse, we don't really know what the Proto Slavic quality of this vowel was. Um, different sources offer different explanations, but the most prevalent and the most common quality modern linguists subscribe or ascribe to this letter is a. Eh. And this is a sound that doesn't really exist in modern Slavic languages anymore. Serbian sometimes uses it, Bulgarian sometimes uses it, Russian sometimes does, but it's usually seen as an allophone. And this a eh sound actually exists in English because we use it in the word have. So in the word have, this a ah sound is what most linguists would say this yet, actually. That was the original sound of the Proto-Slavic yet. Do we know this for sure? No. <laughs> but that's what linguists say. Um, but <laughs> it wouldn't be fun if it wasn't cat, exactly. So that sound. Um, but it wouldn't be fun if it wasn't even more complicated. And it is. Because this sound evolved pretty rapidly. So um, the exact quality is again in disputation, but it probably represented a tense 
low back vowel a eh, after non-palatal consonants in blocked positions. And this is a lot of fancy words, but it basically means that when it was uh, this yat followed a consonant, so it was in a closed position, it represented the sound a. Eh. But in unblocked positions, so when it was the first letter of a word, it probably represented a different sound. And this sound was probably something like y plus a or a, specifically for South Slavic. So let me reiterate this. In Proto-Slavic, this probably had one sound, a. This sound started developing quite rapidly. And this gave rise to different pronunciations of this letter in different circumstances, meaning in different parts of a word, in different geo uh, geological, <laughs> geographical locations, this sound changed. Um, and when we look at Old Church Slavonic, it was probably had two different sounds. The first one was a, eh, and the second one was ya ja or ya. Ja. Yeah, it's, we should bring it back though. A uh, like in cat. Mm -hmm. English likes a. Uh, a uh, sound in English is incredibly common. Um, now, to make matters yeah, geological. <laughs> so, to make matters even more complicated, the first Slavic script, glagolitic, only had one symbol to represent this sound. So, even though it, represent, it represented two different sounds, they only use one symbol, and it looks like a triangle. It basically, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. Something like this with a line right here. But eventually, when... Perfect, Daniel, thank you so much. That one is the one I needed. Sure. Yep, there we go. So, uh, eventually, when the Cyrillic script was adopted, this letter was split up into two different letters, one being yat and the second one being ya. So glagolitic script only had the glagolitic script only had one symbol for these two sounds, while the Cyrillic script had two, because Cyrillic more so described to the like mentality of one sound uses one letter. More so than um, more so than than glagolitic. Just a second. Now, I'm not done yet <laughs> because this is not the end of our amazing letter. So um, this sound, as I said, started changing and it started changing rapidly. And because the Slavs eventually became <laughs> geologically, uh, <laughs> geographically isolated, the, the sound started shifting in different regions. In the old Slavic region, it shifted to a ie sound and uh, ie and i in the southern Slavic uh, languages it started shifting to ie, ja, e, and in the West Slavic languages e as well. Uh, so all of these different regions use their own reflexes, but they only use one symbol to basically unite all of them, right? So they use one symbol, but it was read differently in different regions. But because this is old East Slavic, we're going to be covering um, the Russian reflexes. Which brings us to old East Slavic. So the original A sound entered um, old East Slavic. And we actually, which is extremely nice, we actually have evidence of this. We have evidence of this amazing letter. So um, as you guys might know, uh, Finnish actually had contact with the early Slavs, right? Because they were bordering the Russian region or modern Russian region. And some words, some Slavic words, entered the Finnish language. And one of these um, Finnish words or Russian words that entered the Finnish language was the Russian word miera, which is the one we covered before. A miera means measure. And this was borrowed into Finnish as mere. And if you listen closely, ma -e, ma -re, we can hear that this is realized with a e sound, which probably means that during that period when that word was borrowed, it still had this a e sound. 
Interestingly enough, later loans, because Finnish borrowed for several centuries, or Russian words for several centuries, um, and so some centuries after this, just a sec, uh, some centuries after this, uh, another Russian word got borrowed into Finnish, which was viest, which in Old East Slavic would be something like vieste, which means news or message. And this was borrowed into Finnish as viesti. So do you guys hear the difference? So we had something like mare with an e sound and viesti. So we can see the development or we can basically see what happened. Some words were borrowed with an a sound while others like viesti were borrowed with an e sound, which is incredibly interesting. So this e sound stuck around for several hundred years and eventually in like the 17th century, um, this became an e sound in standard Russian. In Northern Russian, so in the Northern regions, some people still use the e reflex. So yet medvid, just like um, uh, Ukrainian does, just like certain parts of Croatia do. So it reflects differently in different regions. It's, it's a very interesting letter, but it's quite complicated because there's some stuff that we simply don't know. But linguists did an amazing job at deciphering this, this letter. Let me read what you guys wrote. Geological, yeah. So it's like ye and yo, since Russians barely use. Kind of, um, but they pronounce it differently, right? So the yo sound entered the Russian language in like the 13th century, but Russians still pronounce it like yo. Uh, no, at least I've never met a Russian that doesn't pronounce the yo, but they will usually not write it. Yeah. The Ukrainian come e. Mm -hmm. What's the deal with? So that is an incredibly rare uh, Cyrillic glyph, uh, which only occurs in like a few manuscripts. And like Daniel said, it's basically just a, uh, a, un, on with uh, an e sound at the front, right? So yeah. And this comes from the Greek tradition of not having a yes sound, so they basically added e. We also have this e air reflex in northern dialects of Russian. Exactly. Yeah, perfect. So Russian, but standard Russian obviously uses e. Um, actually, read some interesting like manuscripts and 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 um, <laughs> like uh, uh, foreign accounts of the Russian language in the 18th and 19th centuries. And basically what happens is that a lot of these diplomats comment on this sound because it's kind of strange to them. And they say that it sounds exactly the same as a e sound or ye, but that Russians somehow consider it to be special. So to them, it sounds like exactly the same thing. There's even like accounts about Nikolai Taroy, so uh, Nicholas II, the last emperor of the Russian empire, that his yet was more refined so that he basically pronounced it correctly if i can put it like that right so basically with the old pronunciation e um but i doubt it um i don't think that they did that um i've listened to one of his speeches there's i think there's only like two sound bites of him available uh, and one of them contains bukwayat and he doesn't pronounce it any any differently than the e or ye sound so very interesting letter. Um, and right here we can actually see the Polish form. So e, right? That would be the Polish equivalent. Just a sec. There we go. So let's cover these words. Oh, before I forget, actually, Julius, thank you for for telling me. So basically, yeah, again, in Bulgarian, you have this ya yeah reflex of the yats, yeah, right? So in Bulgarian, the, the country is basically divided up into two parts. Uh, one part, the yats yeah turn into a, e, like in Serbian, and the other part, it turned into ya, yeah, like Bulgarian. And in Polish, we have ia yeah and ie too. Exactly. Oh, thank you for reminding me, Daniel. Uh, the interesting thing is that in early Proto-Slavic, the yats sometimes turn into an a ah sound. This is incredibly like most people don't know about this, but um, sometimes it turned into an a ah sound. 
So something like ležat, meaning to lay down, right? Uh, Proto-Slavic would be ležati, uh, but early Proto-Slavic or the early Proto-Slavic form would be something like ležati. So there was a yat, which turned into a, which turned, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really complicated. Perfect. So let's move on to the words. Uh, yes. Um, this is, uh, the modern Russian equivalent is the exact same thing. So this would be forest, right? So modern Russian uses yes. Um, the only Slavic form would be something like yes, uh, forest, woods, or wood, uh, uh, which comes from Proto-Slavic les. So uh, modern Russian e, um, old East Slavic ie, and Proto-Slavic a. So second one, jedu v sanjah. Um, so this is actually three different words. The first one is jedu, which means I'm driving or riding on a sleigh. Uh, v, meaning on or in, and sanjah, right, which is a sleigh, which is the plural prepositional form of this, this word. So I'm driving or I'm riding on a sleigh. Um, modern Russian would be jechat, right, full, uh, uh, verb, uh, which comes from Old Slavic iechati, which comes from Old Church Slavonic jachat. Again, in Old Church Slavonic, if it was the first letter of a word, it would be pronounced like ja or ja. We don't quite know which, uh, what the correct pronunciation would be, either ja or ja. This is also the reason why in modern Church Slavonic, if yat is the first word or a first letter, they will write it with the symbol. So, uh -huh. so v in Proto-Slavic, this would be something like v, uh, meaning in or inside, and sanyach, which in modern Russian uh, is sanyi, which is the plural form and comes from Proto-Slavic san. And this one, piena. Um, which in English is something like foam or lather, which is this foam that forms um, close to the water of the sea, right? Uh, which comes from Proto-Slavic pana or piena in Old East Slavic. We have siena, which means hay, uh, Old East Slavic grass, hay or fodder. So this would be pronounced something like sieno, um, Proto-Slavic seno, meaning hay. Then we have this one, which is hren, or hren, uh, in Old East Slavic, which is a horseradish. So Old East Slavic, Proto-Slavic, hren, meaning horseradish. And the etymology is unknown. Um, one of the basically um, proposed etymologies would be something like kerain, um, which is the ancient Greek word for horseradish, or one of the ancient Greek words for horseradish. And then we at last have this one. Sl uh, <laughs> it's difficult to switch between pronunciations. Let me just use modern Russian. Sled. Uh, so this would be track, footprint, or trace. And in Old East Slavic, this would be something like sled. And in Proto Slavic, this would be sled, meaning trace or track. And lastly, we have to cover the text. This is the most difficult text out of all three because it contains one kind of ambiguous part, uh, which is kind of hard to translate. Uh, so if you guys have any suggestions, please let me know. Help is always appreciated. So uh, let's use the reconstructed pronunciation because that makes the most sense. So jechati komu po žizni se polju. So jechati, which means to ride, right? This one, ride, kamu, to someone. But in this case, it actually means when someone is riding. So when someone is riding, po, on, žizni, life, se, this, polju, this field. So when someone is riding on the field of this life. Razmyšljaj prisno zdje Božu volju. So razmyšljaj, imperative form of uh, imperative form of think, so think, prisna, which is the old East Slavic word for always, prisna um, i so this is a very common 
uh, Church Slavonic saying, which means forever and always. Размишляя присно здесь, all these Slavic forms of здесь meaning here. Божу, we can see this titlo, right, which is the sacred abbreviation. So God's will. So think always here, God's will. Лежете, exactly. So this all sounds familiar in North African Arab dialects, especially the Tunisian dialect. They pronounce a sound quite similar to this one. The only example I know is of blah. Interesting. Nice, Nikolai. I didn't know that. Grisha. Prisno, da, spasiba tebe. So, uh, Grisha just um, corrected me. It would be prisna i vo vjeki vjekov. That would be the correct uh, phrase. Thank you. So, um, this one is kind of difficult. This, these two sentences. В начале ли кто иных потребует? So, at, in or at the beginning, um, ли, question marker, кто, who, иных, different, or someone, other, потребует, needs. So, if someone, in the beginning, others needs, like needs someone else, so, in the beginning, if someone needs someone else, в средстве ли в конце начале взыскует? This would be something like in, tool, question marker, in or at the end, beginning. Uh, hmm. We'll find, right? This is very difficult. So, hmm. In a tool, in the end, at the beginning, <laughs> we'll find. This is very ambiguous. Uh, if someone in the beginning needs, uh, no, others needs in Средство, right? A tool at the end, in the beginning, we'll find. So if someone understands this, please let me know. Because I have no clue what this means. Maybe this is, refers to some kind of biblical passage I'm not familiar with. Um, okay. This one does make sense. So в купность Бог связа уды во телесы. This contains a lot of uh, words that modern Russian doesn't use anymore. So, v in kupnost. So, kupnost is kupa, uh, which is an, a very dated Russian word. Uh, in modern Russian, this would be something like kucha, meaning heap, group, or pile. So, uh, in a group, bog, so this is God, sacred form, sviaza, so connected or bound, Ude, this is again a very archaic Russian word, which means limbs, like uh, extremities of a body, right, to the bodies. So God connected or bound limbs to the bodies. He gave them life. Распри не бите и письмян словесе. So распри не бите actually means don't be in discord, not as in the program, but don't quarrel, right? Don't argue um, needlessly. Uh, and this probably uh, is a reference to the Bible, uh, specifically Prover Proverbs 6, 19. A false witness that speaketh lies, and him that soweth discord among brethren. So in Church Slavonic, this would be something like, So, so again, a reference to the Bible. I pismian v slavies. So and be literate, pismian, pismen in writing or be well spoken. Sama yat glaset. So yat on her own. So they refer to her, the letter. While modern Russian use usually uses the masculine form, this uses the feminine form. So yet on her own is spoken or pronounced. I v glagole jedu. So even in the verb I go. So basically says that yet is part of this, this uh, word. So gde i v počinstve. So even uh, and in the beginning. Počinstve uh, means standing in front. 
Sorry for coming late. I moved to my own flat. Oh, nice, man. Congrats. Nice. Nice to see you. Congratulations. Поздравляю. А, so, где и в починстве не требят следу, следу, so, even when in the beginning there's a trace, right, следу, so, sometimes it's needed, even when it's there. This might actually refer to the fact that in Church Slavonic, if uh, sometimes a yet is written like this, so whenever uh, it's the first uh, letter of a word, yet will usually be written like this, so it might be a reference to that one. And then, в лепоте, везде, человече, буде. So, in beauty, лепота, uh, quite archaic Russian, um, quite archaic Russian phrase of saying beauty. Какая лепота? Uh, in beauty, везде, everywhere, человече, буде. So, be man. So, be man in beauty, everywhere. Uh, basically referring directly to humans, right? To us people. Возвеселиться сердце ти и груди. Which basically means rejoice heart to you uh, uh, and uh, breast. Oh, James, nice to have you, man. <laughs> Привет. So basically rejoice uh, heart to you and or sow your heart and your breast which is where life comes from right uh, might be a reference to uh, bearing childbearing right giving milk to uh, uh, a child um, providing so uh, you will rejoice uh, or your heart and your breast will rejoice and that's it guys <laughs> that's these three um, very interesting pages I think we've covered everything. Буква И, буква Е, буква Ять. So about the Ять, there's still people that use it. I use it when I write Russian um, because I like etymological spellings, um, but it was really difficult. Uh, I don't know, Pixel, but it says message deleted by the Google moderator team. I didn't delete your message, so I don't know what it was. Uh, that's it guys I think we covered everything are there any questions about any of the letters that we covered or anything you guys don't want to know about these letters or, or anything in particular because you can ask them now. If not, uh, and you think of something like a bit later, just write it in the comments. Um, I reply to every single comment. So if you guys still have any questions afterwards, just let me know and I can send you some, some information. If I know, <laughs> because I forgot to say it at the beginning, but uh, I'm not a linguist, I'm not a theologian. I just do this for fun. This is what I love, my passion. So, um, let's see. There we go. I think this should work, right? Yeah, it does. Perfect. So thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, it means a lot. Let's see. Oh, I can actually not see this now. Hmm. Oh, Manel. Brate moi di sti. <laughs> nice to see you, man. I hope you're getting some sleep. So basically, uh, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope it was enjoyable. I hope you like. Uh, I hope you liked it. Uh, there's some people again. I really want to thank. First of all, I want to thank Von Dog for helping me out with the translations. Second of all, Julius and Leonidas, thank you for the Greek uh, stuff, <laughs> some of the Greek words. And uh, I really want to emphasize that I want to thank my patrons because you guys make. It possible for me to invest more time into this. So special thanks to Felix, Aldama, Valentin, Grisha, Dvier Federacija, Yasha, and Pixelation. 
or basically pixelation, right? Thank you so much for, for uh, helping me out. And uh, if there are any questions, just please let me know in the, um, in the comments. And I will see y'all next time. Спасибо вам. I'm proud of you guys. И увидимся. Давайте пока.